we are in the middle of a series, a sermon series on prayer. And if you missed last week's sermon, Jamie laid out the groundwork for the life of prayer, or as she called it, the divine conversation. Jamie framed prayer as simply getting into a space where we can speak to God and God can speak back to us. She says that she fears that we have overcomplicated prayer, that many feel intimidated to speak to God. They don't feel holy enough or articulate enough. And she pointed to the fact that in church, we sometimes have these pre-written prayers, like the one that I just read, well thought out, covering lots of things. And she says that prayer is not required to be in that form for it to be genuine and useful, heartfelt. That speaking to God is much easier than that. In this vein, she quoted Richard Foster's insight that in prayer, you do not pray what ought to be in you, you pray what is really in you. This is the starting point. Prayer does not need to be hours long and spoken in poetic prose in order for it to be a successful time of prayer. A couple weeks ago, I had a big meeting that would determine uh, the next year of my life in very significant ways. And I remember before going into that meeting, just stopping and saying, God, I am so anxious right now. Be with me. That is a genuine and useful prayer. And most importantly, it's a simple prayer. One that doesn't need to be magnified to be heard by God. You can also imagine a time that you were around a table, perhaps with people that you love. You're having good food and vibrant conversation. Think about stopping and just saying, God, I think this might be what heaven is like. Thank you for this. Genuine prayers do not need to be long or complicated. So if last week was about establishing the groundwork for prayer, really introducing us to the divine conversation, then this week is about putting tools in your tool belt to enter into that conversation. It is critical to say, though, these are tools and not rules, okay? These are not fences to force you down a particular path. They are merely signposts pointing you in a possible direction. Choose whichever feels most alive to you. Maybe whatever feels like it might simplify prayer for you. But I'll say this one quick caution before we get into these three insights. And this will be a sermon maybe unfamiliar. It's, it's not like other sermons. I'm not going to necessarily Um, preach from a passage, I'm going to give you some practical insights, some practical things for you to try. So buckle in. Uh, I promise it'll pay off, but it will be short and it'll be practical, sweet and to the point. But I want to give you one caution before we get into these couple different signposts. Don't be turned away from these because they might sound weird to you. Okay? I love this story uh, that a rabbi tells. Uh, Somebody came to him with this question of, why does your God ask you to do such peculiar things in the Bible? Unfamiliar with the practices of Judaism. This kind of sense of, why does he ask you to do such peculiar things? And the rabbi responded, why would I follow a God that asks me to do precisely what I was already going to do? Right? The gospel is not merely common sense. Some of it is going to feel unfamiliar. And again, ask yourself, why would you follow a God that asks you to do precisely what you were already going to do? So with that said, I want to give you three path markers this morning for prayer. Okay? The first is a simple form of contemplative prayer. It's called breath prayer. 
At its simplest, it is choosing a short phrase or a word and connecting that with our breathing, with an intention and attention to our breath. You can choose whatever you would like. For instance, Holy Spirit, be with me. Jesus, be my friend. Or maybe a word, grace, Abba, love, or peace. But there is one that has been practiced for nearly 2,000 years. It's called the Jesus Prayer. It goes back to the desert monks. And they connected these words with their prayers. When they breathed in, they would say in their mind, Jesus Christ, Son of God. And then they would breathe out, have mercy on me. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me on me. This is a very old prayer and is taken from a couple places in the New Testament. However, the monks of the early church, just a couple hundred years after Jesus, began praying this prayer along with paying attention to their breathing, saying that God is closer to us than ourselves. God is breath. Holy Spirit is breath. The life that is given to us is breath. And so this practice of paying attention to our breathing is a deeply Christian and ancient practice. So, if you're interested in being more contemplative or trying to form a meditation practice, try this. Sit in a comfortable position, upright, feet on the ground, close your eyes and focus on your breath while saying these words, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, or whatever you choose. An added level to this practice, specifically with the Jesus prayer, is to reflect on the fact that you're breathing in Jesus Christ, and you are breathing out in recognition that God will have mercy on you. Contemplative prayer invites us to stillness, and it invites us to search within ourselves for God. This may at first seem foreign or even non-Christian to many of us. Isn't this a terrible form of narcissism seeking God within us? Isn't Christianity about seeking God outside, not about navel-gazing? This might make us feel really uncomfortable. And yes, I can see those dangers, but the radical claim of Christianity is that God is not indeed far from any of us, but is alive and active within us. Think of these scriptures. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 47. Or this from Isaiah. By waiting and by calm you will be saved. In quiet and in trust your strength lies. Or this from Luke 17. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Look, here it is, or there it is. No, for in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. Or this from Acts 17. So that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, Though indeed, he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Or this from Augustine, you were within me, but I was outside of myself. The contemplative tradition is is in recognition that the God who made us and gave us the image of God is found not in great adventures and grand gestures, but in becoming still and silent. We often seek for God's voice. The contemplatives are telling us that God is always speaking, but we are just too loud to hear. A second type of prayer that I want to invite you to is what might be called imaginative contemplation. In this type of contemplation or meditation, We imagine a scene taking place and we put ourselves into it. 
This can be done in a couple of different ways. But the first is to take a biblical story, say the parable of the Good Samaritan. And you read through the story, or perhaps listen to it. I find that listening to it, it allows me to get into a space that is more reflective. But you listen to the story, say, of the Good Samaritan, and then you close your eyes and you imagine that you are one of the characters in the story. The man who is robbed, one of the passers-by, the Good Samaritan. Reflect on how you would feel in that story. The horror you would feel being passed by as the, pa- the person who is robbed. The shameful aversion of the eyes of the person who walked by. The immense gratitude once the Samaritan reaches out in compassion. The purpose of this type of practice is to move scripture from just being content that we put into our heads and instead something that reaches our hearts and our imagination. Knowing things about God and knowing God are two different things. The last suggestion that I have for you this morning is to take a walk. I think a lot of us get caught up in the old image of hands clasped and heads bowed. Maybe we associate prayer with being on our knees next to our bed or something like that. I find those forms of prayer to be difficult. Sometimes, especially in our homes, in this kind of posture, we might find ourselves getting distracted pretty quickly. Going for a walk can put us in a different headspace. We don't have to be self-conscious about a lull in the conversation with God. When sitting in a chair or if you're kneeling, if you don't know what to say next, you'll probably just move on pretty quickly. Imagine being in prayer and you close your, your hands like this and you're praying and then you, you stop. You don't know what to say next and so I'm going to go do the dishes, right? Very quickly, we can move on if we don't feel like we have anything to say. If you are walking, you have no reason to move on so quickly. Just like going on a walk with a friend, there can be lulls in the conversation, and that's just fine. My suggestion would be this, especially if you feel like you are still a beginner in prayer. Download an app like Pray As You Go. Pray as you go. Every single morning, these charming Jesuits from the UK put out a 15-minute guided prayer. It includes lovely music, guided scripture readings, and questions for reflection. Go on a walk and listen to pray as you go. But then after it ends, keep walking. Five minutes, ten minutes, just keep walking and allow whatever rises up to rise up. Maybe one of the reflection questions really caught you, or maybe now you're just in the space to talk to God. Allow that to happen. Maybe you follow one of those rabbit trails. This is a good way to enter yourself in to prayer. Maybe you could pray for your neighborhood while you're out walking those around you. I want to close this morning with two encouragements when beginning to pray. The first is start with the path of least resistance. If any of these suggestions feel natural to you or feel exciting to you or feel alive to you, try there first, right? Try the thing that will make the habit build and not something that feels onerous or hard from the beginning. Start with the easy stuff. And then you can tackle the harder stuff later. That's the first encouragement. The second is, and you may have already heard me say this if you read the chimes for last, uh, last quarter, but I, wanna, I want you to think about success more in terms of baseball than school. Now, I'm sorry to give you a sports analogy. Uh, I promise that it pays off, okay? But in school, we think of success as very high number. 90% is a success, right? 95%. Anything under 70 is failing. That is a recipe for disaster in your prayer life. 
If I'm, if I'm not 70% successful, I'm a failure. Can you imagine if you pray four times a week, but you miss a couple days and consider yourself a failure? That is a terrible starting point. But in baseball, the best hitters in the world are only successful 30% of the time. The very, very best. That means they can fail 700 out of 1,000 times and still be elite. So my encouragement to you is if you are beginning to pray, set your bar a little lower. Consider success a little lower. God is with you. He is not far off. And I hope that these strategies can help you connect with God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.